Ladies and gentlemen, I now have the pleasure of welcoming to the stage Mr. My Michael Tusiani, Chairman Emer uh, Emirates of Poten and Partners, for a brief overview of the tanker market and a short introduction of the panel discussion that will follow his presentation. Good morning to all. Uh, thank you, Mr. Abdul Karim, for hosting us here today. Uh, it's certainly good to be here. And uh, as you can determine, I have a very bad cold, so I will try to do my very best, and I thank you for your understanding. Today, I have the pleasure of moderating a discussion among three of the major players or titans of our industry. These gentlemen need no introduction. They are internationally well-known and renowned. My statement is easily supported by a quick look at their company's total tanker fleet. This includes product carriers. Marin, 55 vessels. Dynacom, 66. Body, 56. Each of them is heavily invested in Suez Maxis and VLCCs, in addition to having significant participation in the bulk LNG and chemical carrier sectors. This morning's discussion, of course, will be on tankers. My aim is to get each individual's view of the current market and his thoughts about the future. These insights will undoubtedly help us all navigate the increasingly uncertain and choppy waters of our industry. In order to provide some context to our discussion, here are some facts and figures that everyone should keep in mind. Global oil production is closing in on 100 million barrels per day, more than 65% of which is transported by sea. Oil prices are fluctuating between 50 and now 60 plus dollars per barrel and are under pressure from bloated global oil stocks and rising oil production from the United States and the Middle East. This is despite OPEC's intervention. In addition, low price environment of the last few years has contributed to a significant decline in upstream investments. From a consumer's standpoint, low prices have stimulated oil demand, forecasted by most to grow by an average of 1.2 million barrels a day annually through 2022. Demand in developed countries is expected to decline because of energy efficiency improvements gain in market share for renewable technologies and demographic changes. On the other hand, industrializing nations, particularly India and China, will account for nearly half of the global oil demand in the next five years. We must note that these two countries alone account for one third of global tanker demand with some 80% of the Middle East exports going to Asia. Only 20% goes west to the Americas and Europe. Amazingly, when I started my career 47 years ago, the complete opposite was true. The dynamics of today's oil markets combined with an oversupply of ships has led to a cha challenging tanker market. The last two years has seen low, continued low freight rates for crude and product carriers. And as a result, despite low yard prices and low interest rates, 2016 new building orders reached their lowest point in more than two decades. While these data paint a pessimistic view of the current market. They may be a positive sign 
that a rebalancing is close at hand. Seasoned ship owners, like our panelists, may look at the reduced order book, the increase in scrappings, and the projected healthy growth in oil demand as the right time to act. About 18 months ago, when Ms. Nugavish came to New York, we talked about this conference. And a few months later, he suggested uh, these two gentlemen to be on the panel. And immediately, I sent him an email saying, why these two? Because Bari doesn't do business or much business with them at all. I'll read you his response. Quote, we want to do business with them, but more importantly, given their accomplishments, we want to learn from them, unquote. So hopefully, to, during today's discussion, we will all learn from each other. Thank you, and let's get started. Today's discussion will be basically covering the general market, financing and investments, public versus private, company strategy, renewables and technology, and the future outlook. And then we'll try to get to some personal insights and personal backgrounds. So let me start off by just giving you a little bit of oversight. Within the various tanker sectors, that each of you are in, you seem to prioritize a different vessel class. Mr. Angelo Cousas, your focus is on VLCCs, Mr. Procopio on Suez Maxis, and Bari on VLCCs. So let me go around the table, starting with you, Mr. Procopio. What makes you choose these segments? First of all, I want to thank Bari and you, Michael, for inviting us in this very prestigious uh, summit to express our views. We are learning every day. We have not reached any conclusion where is the end and where is the beginning. So I want to thank everybody that is here for uh, attending this uh, uh, interview or whatever, this discussion rather. Coming on your question, which uh, uh, is uh, the reason, we take, I take the decisions with gut feeling, not with analysis. So I'm the worst example for predictions. <laughs> so, and I never dare to make predictions, but having a balanced fleet between VLCCs and Suez Maxis gives the chance to serve long hauls and medium hauls. And as the trade is always changing and is the price differential, the arbitrage that exists and so on, we see that uh, traders, not so much uh, producers, they like the, to bet on the million barrel size sometimes instead of, and also we see that we can supplement the VLCC uh, trade by chartering two Suez Maxis, giving the flexibility to go to various ports. And with the differential of uh, consumption and uh, so on, it, we can compete. And uh, we spread the eggs in two baskets. Thank you. Mr. Angel Cousins, why do you focus on VLCCs? Well, I'll try to give some different answers to what George said, because he covered practically everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
First of all, because they are easy vessels to operate. Uh, from an operational expense point of view, I find them disproportionately cheaper to their size. Uh, the threshold to entry is relatively high, so you don't get too much competition in that. And from my experience, usually good markets start from VLCCs. However, to complement George's answer, I must say recently we expanded in Suez Maxes as well, because I see it as a sector expanding. And it proved rather a nice, a correct decision, if I may say so. However, uh, if the market is good, the market is good. If the market is bad, it's, it affects both of those sectors the same. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me welcome everyone in the name of uh, Bahri and uh, all the distinguished uh, guests uh, here today. This forum uh, used to be conducted in London a few years ago and most recently in Dubai. And I'm going to suggest that the next one should be done in Riyadh. Uh, and we'd like to invite everyone in Riyadh. Uh, secondly, I am, uh, and we are all honored to have these two uh, gentlemen with us today. And I must say that uh, I feel very humbled. And uh, among all of you, I am a learner here today because I'm only part of the governance of Bahri. I, uh, I don't own a ship myself, so I feel uh, uh, a bit awkward uh, uh, talking about this. But having, uh, having said that, we as uh, Bahri uh, today, you know, as you know, we are, we are a Saudi Arabian company, uh, although we operate internationally. We are located in the hub of energy in the world. And our uh, clients are all over the world, uh, in the Americas and Asias. And uh, VLCC offers the right uh, vessel uh, for us to reach out to these uh, clients. And uh, they are offer uh, economies of scale, as uh, the gentleman mentioned. And they are easier to operate. So this is ma mainly why. So from this discussion, would, would anybody want to take a, a gamble on what's going to be more prevalent, the million barrel cargoes or two million barrel cargoes in the future? Given the trades of the, the new markets that are developing, anybody want to take a guess? Well, you want me to start? Yeah. OK. Uh, I believe that in a good market, both cargoes are going to be expanding more than smaller sizes. Uh, the triangulation obviously has helped a lot in that. Uh, but the most important factor is the fact that we have new major areas of production, like Iraq, uh, Iran today, and particularly US Gulf. US Gulf, they are expecting to have two and a half million barrels of crude exported in a year or two, and they will need Suez Maxes and VLCCs. And this is going to grow. This, I think, makes us feel uh, quite strongly about these uh, two sizes. I, I personally think that both, both sectors will, will grow. Uh, obviously, Bahri does not operate in the smaller uh, segment, but uh, as I said earlier, uh, we put our customers in front and we grow with the customers. If that's what the customers want, we're willing to invest. Okay. Yeah. I have made a, a calculation uh, on uh, capital cost, running cost, uh, fuel and so on. So it uh, comes, the analogy comes uh, very much uh, equally on VLs and Suez Maxis. But the past experience over the years, <coughs> sorry, I started uh, buying those in, uh, in 1990, and we had always VLCCs and Suez Maxis. All the years, Suez Maxis made a better result than VLCCs. 
Now, in the recent years, the opposite is true in the very, very... Uh, only future, you say, but trade is changing so much, and the pattern, and the ton miles, and the new port, and new uh, buying or uh, the, uh, loading or discharging areas. So it remains to be seen. If we knew Michael will invest all in <laughs> one sector, we don't know. All right, let's switch to the product carrier sector. Now, Bari, in recent years, has significantly increased its exports of products. Do you plan to strengthen this activity in, the, in, in this sector, the activity in this sector? Yeah, actually, uh, today our main client is uh, Aramco. And uh, we're, we're, uh, we have uh, an exclusive relationship to, to carry all Aramco delivered, uh, delivered crude. Aramco uh, uh, is, is uh, a client uh, and an owner in the company uh, and uh, a prestigious partner. Uh, and uh, we have recently in engaged uh, in a relationship with Aramco to carry products as well. So yes, we are going to be more and more active in the CPB uh, space. And although they don't offer long hauls, as you know, uh, but uh, uh, this is a new, uh, a new market for us, and we, we plan to expand it. Mr. Kousis, do you plan to invest in product carriers? I'm sorry? Do you plan to invest in product carriers? Well, we have done it in the past, and I must say the results were not great. So I'm kind of superstitious. <laughs> and uh, to make it simple, and put in economic terms, I think they are not that profitable. The threshold to, earn, to entry, unfortunately, is very low. Sure. They are expensive to operate, and their tendency to have accidents going in too many ports is quite high. Now, if, on the other hand, one of our major clients had the contract for us, exactly. we would do anything. <laughs> we can do it. OK. <laughs> And how about Dynacom? Do uh, you have any plans to expand in the product we carrier? Have, we have already a uh, presence with uh, 10 LR1s. And I believe that uh, the financial uh, crisis of 2008 have uh, derailed all predictions because it was the first uh, crisis uh, in the years I remember that the banks created and inflicted the problem to the markets and, and to their clients, not the clients, to the banks. And this derailed the whole uh, growth of the economy where uh, product carriers are more in demand. I believe that the presence and to be able to give to your clients a full service of any type of tonnage they require is very important. And yes, we, in the right uh, conditions, will expand also in this uh, sector. Let's uh, turn to uh, investments. Back in, uh, in the 70s, the traditional ship owners, such as yourselves, would basically order a ship and then go to the bank and get the financing required. Are these old days gone? And how do you finance your vessels? So let's start with you, Mr. It is uh, very correct uh, what uh, you say, Michael. Uh, I entered in shipping in 1971 with one third of a tanker. Uh, the other two thirds was belonging to two friends and uh, was financed 95% by the bank, another 3% by me, the others didn't put any dollar. And <laughs> the, first, the first hire, because it was five, uh, five years time charter to Terracuni. So at that time, I was uh, uh, being a civil engineer in the real estate. I was uh, impressed, and which at uh, that time you could not obtain 
a drachma loan from Greek banks in, in our business. <coughs> I was impressed to go to London with the others that they knew the business and to go to GATX, GATEX, and take this type of uh, loans. So I said, this is the paradise. <laughs> you, you can, you, if you have a good pro, uh, project and you believe in it, you can do it. So, yes, these days have gone. And especially uh, after 2008, European banks have uh, almost disappeared. And the ones that they say that still in shipping, this is just uh, superficial. They recently they start again. Uh, at that time, you end up to 2008, you were making any deal, and in a week it was financed. Now you have to be very careful because these days have gone. And uh, what counts now is the Chinese presence in financing, which is very strong, and wherever is a vacuum in nature, somebody comes. And now we have China taking the leading role in ship financing. Senator hmm. how do you finance your vessels? And are those old days gone? Totally. It's not a matter of the old days being gone, Michael. Uh, it's the fact that to go and ask your bank uh, whether you should buy a vessel or not, uh, it's not the right role for the bank. They are not the experts. And uh, I think their opinion uh, cannot be respected more than what it is worth. Uh, we are a private company, as you know, and as such, we have to retain sufficient liquidity to do what we like and then go to the bank and tell them, look, that's what we bought, uh, if you are interested to finance it. And so far, we have had no problem. Uh, I know George said that European banks uh, are practically bankrupt, uh, but there is sufficient liquidity in the market and relatively cheap. Uh, I think for the right company and I must uh, say with pride, we have never had any problem with our banks. We have never defaulted. We can find money whenever we need it and for whatever purpose so far we have proposed to them. How does Barry, Barry finance its fleet growth and uh, replacement? And also, does Islamic financing come into play? Well, uh, I, I must say that uh, uh, investment decisions uh, largely depend on the business case. Uh, you know, investors like the banks uh, would like to see the return on, on investment. So, uh, first of all, banks in the region have money. They have liquidity, and in fact, they are welcoming investment. But as an investor, you have to have the right feasibility. Uh, a robust balance sheet, uh, and uh, you have to be patient in returns as well. I mean, this is not a, a very quick payback business. Uh, you, you know, when you invest in VLCC, you have to be in it for the long haul, uh, just like carrying the, the, the crude for the long haul. Uh, so uh, in our case, you know, uh, it's a split between equity and debt, uh, obviously largely debt. But us being a public company, we have also access to finance through the market, so we, we have no, no issue. And this was actually uh, proven when we uh, did the merger slash acquisition with Bella. Uh, we raised money from the market and our investors uh, uh, responded very favorably. But just to continue on this point, you have a, a, a very unique position that you're an exclusive provider to Aramco. How does this influence your, your decision making, your growth and, and everything else? You, you, know, you, you have this huge customer exclusively. Uh, for, well, first of all, uh, it's, it's, um, 
it's a win-win relationship. We have, uh, yes, we have exclusivity on all the delivered crude that uh, Aramco delivers to its customers. Uh, but that contract is also market indexed. So it's not, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's linked to the market. The prices and rates are linked to the market. Uh, having said that, uh, Aramco is a great client, uh, you know, to have. They are a big source of business for us, not only on crude. So we do, we're, as you correctly mentioned a while ago, we started doing uh, uh, CPP business with them uh, in small tankers. Uh, we're also uh, collaborating with them and doing cargo uh, using using our liners. Aramco is uh, getting into the chemical space, so there'll be a great scope for our uh, dry bulk business as well with them. So uh, I must say we are uh, we're delighted to have that relationship. And at the end of the day. Aramco owns 20% of the business. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, we all know that uh, the shipping business is very capital intensive and not for the faint at heart. Today's new building price for VLCC is 80 million, a Suez Max, approximately 55, at a good yard, and an MR at around 35 in that ballpark. Uh, I'll ask each one of you. Given the capital intensiveness, uh, what advice would you give people interested in investing in shipping? Mr. Broker Pio. Some people, uh, and especially funds and so on, they, they believe that ship is a money printing machine. Ships are not printing money. In order to be successful, you have to offer qua quality service. And this is the target of our company and all, all serious companies to offer quality service to their clients. So depending on the investor, if the investor wants to be part of a public company and so on, they have to see the track record and uh, uh, the, the respectability that enjoys versus the market service that they are providing and also the fundamentals. But I would take your question as for individuals to invest and become ship owners. This is what is you, you mean, because yes. I do believe that the strength of Greece is that is fertile the ground to produce new names in every cycle. <laughs> and uh, this and the old names, uh, the successful names after one, two, sometimes three generations, they go to safer business than shipping. So they don't want to stay and to risk the way that we are risking. So my advice is that it is possible, but the focus should be in quality, service, no matter what is the segment that they want to get in. And in every cycle, every time we see new names coming up and being very successful. Mr. Angel Kousis, what's your comment? Well, uh, I'll concentrate on people who want to enter the business and not funds. Funds have basically money and they don't care if they lose it, it's not theirs. But if there is an individual who wants to enter the business, there is no doubt he must realize that shipping, tanker shipping has cycles and he must be able to stick through them. There is no doubt that market, the market will change it's absolutely guaranteed, but will he be there when it changes? And if he is there, most probably he will recoup his money. Mm. Well, first of all, I agree with you. Uh, 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 this business is not for the faint-hearted. I mean, you, uh, you have to be uh, uh, 
courageous. Uh, you have to have a long-term view, uh, and uh, you have to weather the storms of the cycles. Uh, and obviously, you have to have uh, a bankable business, a bankable balance sheet that supports uh, the capital investment, because you cannot finance all of this from equity. You have to borrow money, and your lenders have to be convinced of your business case. You have Saudi Aramco, which is a big, big, big plus. But how do you survive the ups and downs of the shipping cycles? You need deep pockets. You need term charters. Can you put everything at risk on spot market? You don't let shipping, uh, well, sh shipping is like, uh, and everything in life is like sailing. If you want to go from here to there, and you have adverse winds, you go by tax left, right, and then you navigate the market. So, yes, you need the uh, deep uh, pockets, but more you need flexibility and adaptability. And always uh, there is, uh, when there is a, a will, is a way. And definitely there are many sleepless nights, but uh, at the same time, when the Go, the going is tough, is the best moment to invest. And as always I say, the tunnels in the shipping market are not straight. They are going straight and they have a bend. So you see dark, dark all the time, and suddenly you see the light. So then it's too, too late. You have to have the courage to invest when the view of the tunnel is completely dark. Mr. Angel Cruises. Uh, first of all, there is no doubt that tanker shipping requires cash. There must be plenty of liquidity to survive no matter what we say. And being a private company, we try to always retain cash. Second, I think relationships are even more important. And you can have relationships with charterers to start with, banks and shipyards. This is very important as well. Even your underwriters count. This creates a mutual relevance between the parties, which makes it useful to both sides to find a way out. But the most important of the lot, in my opinion, is the organization. Shore-based and sea-going personnel. You need people who are loyal, committed, and share your values. This creates a perfect recipe for success. Uh, I think these gentlemen have uh, uh, answered uh, everything. I just want to add that uh, uh, this is definitely a long-term business. And uh, you know, on the one hand, you have uh, investments and assets. And on the other hand, you have asset trade. Asset trade can also be a good source of business if you do it right. And I must say that we in Bahri are not uh, experts in this. We haven't done this. So I'm, we're learning from these two uh, gentlemen how to do asset trades. And they, the Greek are the best in the world in doing this. But uh, uh, definitely, uh, this is a long-term business. And also another issue is that this is a business that lends itself to scale. Uh, you have to have the scale. Uh, you know, having one or two ships is not going to uh, make you a millionaire, uh, you know, all of a sudden. But when you have a big fleet, uh, you can price better, you can avail cargoes quicker, and uh, this, this way your, your viability improves as a business. Uh, public versus private. Back in uh, 1970, I recall that OSG was one of the only publicly listed companies. And for many years, its stock value was basically flat. And the, the answer was, it's steady, but there was no volatility. Today, people like volatility, it seems. Now, both of you, you remained, you're, of course, public listed in Saudi Arabia, private, you have an MLP for the gas. 
What are your comments about private versus public? Great source of capital, or at least seems to be a better source of capital. So let's start off, Mr. Angel Cruz. Well, as you know, we have been public in the past with a small company, but uh, it was not a success. So it was privatized in 2000. It was in dry cargo, as a matter of fact. And it took us a hell of a job to privatize it. Now, uh, this taught me a lesson, and I don't like personally public very much. I like to be master of my own fortune and not of the shareholders. You need public sometimes to expand, but I don't think it's the ideal way for tankers. As a private company, we try to have cash. As a public company, you have to invest it. And at the end of the day, investors I find are not loyal and knowledgeable enough to go through the road. Usually they abandon you at the wrong minute, moment. <laughs> I can say that the, the principle uh, of the public versus private it is on the way that the, the small experience that I have in the public uh, sector is that uh, they want the highest possible leverage and to distribute all the profits when <coughs> you have such. This is against the opposite that you need to, to, to go through the cycles. Being a cyclical business, when the market is uh, good, you have to retain your profits and you have to lower your leverage. Yes, and this is very opposite to what they are asking. If you do that on a public company, you are penalized. You are not good enough. You, you are very conservative to their taste. But unfortunately, we have seen in the last cycle, especially in the tanker uh, uh, public companies, that almost all with exception one, because you had a deep pocket behind it, they were practically bankrupt. And we have not seen this on the private ones. So yes, it's a good source of, liqu of liquidity in case, and that's why we did the MLP uh, in order to expand uh, the LNG business uh, rapidly, because the windows of opportunity are not there forever. Uh, but mm -hmm. then the correlation with the oil price versus shares which was very wrong. For instance, in a tanker uh, company, when the oil uh, price uh, collapsed, uh, they, they had the best uh, results because the fuel uh, uh, element was the lowest, being the biggest uh, expenditure of a tanker company. The shares of tanker companies were penalized because the price of oil went down. So it is, uh, or the, the, there is not enough uh, uh, education to the investors of uh, public companies that they should insist for the opposite of what they are asking. Uh, eventually, I think they will learn. I have to respect the view of the, uh, of the two gentlemen because they are private companies, but obviously uh, we being a public company uh, see the benefits of being public. Uh, Public brings you uh, better corporate governance, uh, transparency. Uh, yes, there is pressure from the shareholders on the dividend side. And it's true that uh, I agree very much that uh, at the good days you should retain cash and reduce your leverage. But uh, this is something the small shareholders don't understand. They want dividend. So it is always a, a paradox and it's a subject for board discussions, how to maintain dividend distribution and at the same time finance your growth plans. Uh, but I have to say that being public has served us well. Uh, it's a good source of capital. Uh, it's a good public image. Uh, and uh, it's part of the whole national theme. It also helps the uh, risk, yes. you know, risk profile yes. quite a bit. Okay, let's talk about competition. Now, all of you are considered among the best ship operators in the world. What factors do you attribute to this reputation? And what sets you apart from everyone else 
and from each other. Let's start with you. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, we have a very well managed uh, uh, oil uh, VLCC division, thanks to Nasser and his team. Uh, we uh, adhere and deploy best, best in class practices in terms of ship management. Uh, we are always trying to be ahead of the curve in terms of compliance with international regulations. We are, uh, as you know, since 2014, we're part of the Qualship program uh, for the U.S. Coast Guard. And everybody in this room knows that only 10% of the ships that call U.S. US ports are actually Qualship. Uh, this comes with an expense, but it also comes with a long-term view of maintaining uh, good reputation, reliable, uh, you know, uh, ship owners. Uh, and I think, uh, finally, we also are in this business for the long haul. So we don't look at short terms. Mr. Procopio. As I said also before, uh, the quality of service gives you the possibility and to look your client in the eyes and say, I'll do your business the way that you want. And the way that they want is upon, after fixing, not to hear again about the cargo or anything, to be delivered, to be flawless. And this is achieved by the good selection of crews, having your own pool of uh, resources. We, as a company, we have our own training center in Manila and in Bombay. Now we have uh, the third generation of people serving on board, father, uh, grandfather, father, uh, grandson. We have reached this level. And one reason that I want to expand is to be able to accommodate all these requests for good people to come on board. This is the fun of the businessman, is to be able to expand and make the family business bigger. They create, when I say family, the extended family. We give the names of our relatives, sons, daughters, granddaughters to the ships because we believe that we have to, first of all, not that we believe, we feel that this is part of the family. And I know the captains, the engineers, the people, and my door is open for the oiler to knock and come in and say his idea. We have a, a, a system that everybody on board can submit his ideas to improve safety, improve performance, uh, uh, economy, and uh, that's giving a good uh, result. If you take good care of the pennies, the dollars are coming. Mr. <laughs> Kuzis, okay. please. Well, <clears throat> personally, I consider myself a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, uh, the second generation, the next generation, because I am of a certain age, my daughter Maria uh, is, I think, more difficult than myself. <laughs> we pay a high attendance to the standard of the vessels we built, which are usually a few million dollars more expensive than the yard standard. And I know it doesn't pay in uh, the market. Spot voyages usually up. You get what you get, but at least you get a better speed and performance. Uh, we have uh, the biggest Greek flag fleet uh, from all, and uh, this shows the emphasis I pay to Greek crews. They are a bit more expensive, but I think they deserve it. They are good, and they are giving us good service. Good quality vessels, admittedly, uh, don't get rewarded when you want to sell them. 
So we practically never sell. We sell only for scrap our vessels. Hmm. It's a good learning. That's our... I think we've answered this. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Um, Mr. Angelo Kousas, you mentioned relationships. Do you believe your company and its, its historical relationships will continue uh, to be critical to your future? Uh, absolutely, <coughs> uh, Michael. And uh, I would say <coughs> we have uh, proven it with our recent transactions in the market. Uh, they say they don't believe in quality on spot vessels. All charterers pay lip service to that. But when it comes to a period business, eventually they want a quality vessel. And this is something we can deliver. And I must say, they respect and we respect what they give to us. Prokopio. Relationships are very important. And uh, not in order to get one dollar more in the rate or a one cent more on the rate, is to have the assurance that they know with whom they are dealing, the charterers, and uh, to know that somebody is behind the phone 24 hours a day. Definitely, as uh, Mr. Angelikus John said, uh, that uh, a good ship starts from the plan approval and the ordering. And we have the same mentality, and always our ships are excelling uh, from the competition, and we spend. But innovation and specialization are the key points for our success. And uh, to be present in markets, you need volume, as correctly was stated before. Volume is very important. To have the possibility to serve your clients, uh, no matter where they want a ship and when and so on. Uh, that is, uh, but also in, in period of low market, what the optionality for the charterer to choose among many vessels, they'll choose yours because of the quality and the relationship, but paying the same low freight. I repeat, nobody, nobody reciprocates favors. So it's all about rate in the end? No, rate and relationship. Oh, okay. The rate is the same, but if there are three, four <laughs> ships waiting for this, you could be the lucky one because of the relationship yours to be chosen okay, at equal terms. Now, mm. Bari, regularly charters from other owners. Where does an owner's reputation fit into your decision making? And in the end, is it all about rate? Well, first, let me comment on the, on the relationship. I, I totally agree that uh, relationships are important, uh, especially with your uh, existing clients. And I would even uh, raise the bar a little bit, and I would say we would push a relationship up to the level of a partnership. And uh, uh, in fact, that has served us well. I mean, in, uh, uh, Aramco today is a client that is uh, becoming a true partner in everything. Uh, in the logistics space, we have worked with some uh, government agencies at a small scale on to help our liner business with particular uh, agencies in Saudi Arabia we have now developed this to be uh, a total logistic solution and we went as far as partnering with uh, Bolloré the French company to actually create a door-to-door -door logistics company uh, we have done the same thing in the dry bulk uh, with uh, with Bongi, and we are also creating a a, a partnership to uh, a pool 
uh, to manage the dry bulk ships with, with Bungie. So, uh, in a way, uh, yes, it's, it's about rates, but also it's about quality rates. Uh, I mean, uh, we don't really, because we, we operate our ships in a, in a, in a certain standards, we, we uh, choose reputable clients, even the ones we charter from. We, uh, we try to work with best-in-class uh, ship owners uh, all the time. Okay, in order to, uh, and this question is for all of you, in order to fix your ship, you must comply with all regulations from port to flag states. However, your company goes above and beyond to meet these minimum requirements. As a result, do you believe you gain, really gain additional business opportunities? Start there. Uh, as I said earlier, I, I think it is important for a big ship owner to be, yes, ahead of the curve. And as you said, go above and beyond the minimum requirements to try to meet and anticipate future requirements. At the end of the day, this, this will pay. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, today, uh, you know, cargo owners are demanding newer ships, better managed ships, ships that comply with, uh, you know, with standards of uh, safety, quality. Uh, so, uh, in a nutshell, yes, it, it, we think it pays to be ahead of the curve. Well, first of all, all of us have to comply with regulations, irrespective of the fact that some of us don't. Uh, I know it happens, but what can you do? Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the reasons uh, we have long-term relationships is because they are certain that we are going to represent them properly in the market. And today, you have checkups continuously, the port state controls, the vetting inspections, and so on and so forth, are continuous and unbelievable. And that's why we decided we need high-quality crew, which is not only familiar with what is required, but loyal to us and will do their best to represent us properly. I believe that uh, this is a, a continuation of our previous uh, discussion about the quality service. Definitely, the amount of regulations are increasing and every, every year there are more regulations and this uh, trend will continue more and more uh, and uh, with computerization, uh, the more that you provide or you have uh, a certain ideas that you implement on your fleet, you see thereafter becoming TMSA 3, which are all the ideas that you, they have seen to you from your office in the previous uh, vetting that they were doing. So the more you give, the more uh, they demand, which is a good thing on the other hand, because the entry bar barrier becomes higher. It's not easy for uh, organizations to to do and adhere to this uh, demanding business. And there are some charterers that they put uh, their deeds where their uh, mouth is. So they charter vessels that they consider from owners as a better quality. And uh, I want to say Chevron is one of those and we are doing the biggest uh, portion of their business. Uh, Total, uh, Shell, there are uh, companies that they're uh, uh, respecting their vetting uh, department, and it's not a commercial vetting, because we have seen also commercial vetting. The standards are lowering when it is a uh, dearth of ships, uh, or they are coming up when there are no ships. So, uh, or, uh, you understand what I mean, depending, and we call it in our uh, company market-related vetting. These, there are two different uh, type of companies. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, that in the low freight market that we have, do you really believe that quality will not be compromised? Uh, uh, quality is a culture. 
So you cannot change the culture with the market uh, swings. So you, it takes effort, years, dedication, teamwork, a very strong office, dedicated, and uh, no matter if your ship is an old one or a young one, I don't, I don't believe that there is any, any relevance. The age has no relevance with quality. Unfortunately, after the Erika and Prestige, in one night, all what the oil companies were saying that Mr. Prokopi, we don't care about the age because at that time we were buying second-hand old ships. What we want is a good performance and uh, when you deliver the cargo and then the speed you have, the pumping out, the crew matrix, uh, the uh, gadgets that we you have on board that we need, uh, we are okay. In one night, uh, age and quality became synonymous. But now it is also very important, all the rest, which is the crew, the procedures, and so on. So I do believe that this trend will keep on going and we'll have uh, companies that they admire and they uh, pay for this and others that they don't care despite what they are saying. How do you view the growing competition from Chinese owners? Well, you didn't ask How me. Uh, I mean, quality, I would like to add, uh, is quite expensive. And when the market is bad, Michael, it's even more expensive. Mm -hmm. But we have no choice but to follow it. If there is an incident or an accident, it could have huge reputational consequences exactly. for the company. Exactly. And uh, whatever we say, we need a highly devoted and qualified crew to cope with those things. Quality is something that very few people adhere to in a bad market. It must be made a fact. You agree? I, I totally agree, yeah, of course, and uh, especially on the reputational issues, uh, especially when you carry a national flag and, and uh, you know, God forbid when there is an incident, it, it has a spillover effect mm -hmm. on the region, on the, na and the, on the nation, everything, yeah. How do you see the competition coming from China, Chinese owners? China is a, a giant and it will continue to be because of its size and the, because of the dedication and uh, of their people which are motivated because they see the results in the everyday, their everyday life. Life in China is improving, life quality of life is improving every six months that uh, you go in China, you see better cars, better houses, better hotels, better restaurants. So this is a, a trend that will not be stopped having a motivated uh, one and a half billion people working for a better tomorrow. So uh, China uh, gives uh, great opportunities and is the land of uh, uh, growth. We have uh, seen that and we have uh, joined forces and we are partners with Sinotrans and C China LNG in the LNG sector doing this very innovative uh, uh, ARC-7 LNG carriers which they go through the North Sea route. And uh, I always believe that uh, synergies with uh, consumers or producers and owners like us and others, they can make only uh, beneficial uh, results for both parties. My definition of synergy, which uh, I say always and they laugh, is one plus one makes three. <laughs> and this additional one is to be split between the partners. So this uh, definition is true. Uh, private companies are flexible and can do things that they ca the uh, state-owned or big uh, other conglomerates they cannot do uh, in the very quick uh, 
way that uh, shipping decisions are required. And uh, we are here to share this ability and to continue the growth with good uh, uh, such synergies. So China gives these opportunities and they are following exactly the opposite road from Japan. They don't want China Inc. as Japan Inc. that because of having everything Japanese, they have 25 years of stagnation. They want a relationship and openness. And this is something that I'm very much uh, aware of and I'm very happy that already is materializing. Uh, Michael, I am confused about your question in view of what George answered. Is it competition from Chinese ship owners uh, or competition from China? Ship owners. Uh, ship owners. Because competition with China is far from. We are collaborating with them in every aspect of the way. Uh, shipping is something that you learn through generations. You cannot buy ships and buy the trade as well. That's the easy bit. You don't buy the trade. We have seen it happening in the past with the, uh, German KGs and others that have even been subsidized by the taxpayer. But uh, so be it. I mean, it happens, it's there, and we have to face it. Where it's interesting is that accidents do happen to the best of us. That's how shipping is. Probably we have made fewer accidents. But dealing with an accident and knowing how to deal is the most important thing. And when it happens, I'd like to see how we react and how others react. I, just to add, I think China uh, 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 provides a, a, a competition to the ship owners in the market, but also they are the main source of business today. They are the main, the main source of, uh, of growth. So, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, you know, tanker business is all about supply. Uh, you know, Chinese uh, investors are smart investors. And I don't think they will flood the market with ships if they see that uh, there is an oversupply of vessels, where, which is the state we are in today. I'm going to stay with you, Mr. al -Sahan. Do you see Bari principally as an owner or a charterer? And is this an advantage or disadvantage? <laughs> Uh, it's an interesting question. Actually, today, um, our current VLCC fleet uh, is not enough to carry all the delivered commitment of uh, Aramco crude. So, uh, from time to time, we, we have to charter in some ships. And this is an interesting position to be in because it gives us access to market insight, uh, keeps us abreast of the uh, you know, supply and demand equation in the tanker uh, business. And uh, uh, it also uh, uh, you know, uh, makes our ship management uh, aware of their cost, uh, benchmarking, uh, I would say it, uh, I see ourselves as principally a ship owner, but we are also a charterer at the same time. What's confusing to me is that uh, as an owner, you advocate for a strong tanker market, which is normal, but your exclusive client wants the opposite. <laughs> so you how do you Aram rectify that? You mean Aramco? Aramco. Yeah. Right, you're, you're talking up the market. They want the lowest possible freight. Well, uh, what, what people don't know is that our agreement with Aramco is also market indexed. So there is a, there is a factor uh, in the pricing for market, current market price, prevailing market price. And 
we, ha we, we normally factor this in when it comes to settling the rates between, uh, between the two of us. Uh, and there is a good level of governance in this relationship which protects against fluctuation. So, yes, uh, there is a bit of a paradox there, but uh, we're mitigating that uh, risk via, you know, through the uh, agreement with Aramco. I, 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 I'm sorry, I cannot go into the details. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Now, both of you are pure ship owners, and you view Bari as basically a charterer. I would imagine. Do you see them as a tough negotiator? I believe that... Uh, Given that you've done very little business with them, I would have to uh, assume. This, this is the reply. That you gave the reply as well. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, Bakri uh, is a very, in a very unique position that has uh, this uh, source of uh, cargo and freight uh, that is uh, always there. But as I understand, what the trader and, uh, needs is a playing field. They don't care if the market is up or down. They, they care that the neighbor is doing at the same level. This is their more interesting part. So, uh, at least the traders. Uh, so if uh, you charter to Glencore or to Vitol, they want that their, the cost per barrel to be the same in order to have the successful trade. Here, of course, is a unique uh, situation where selling uh, CIF, if the freight element is low and the prices are fixed, you have a better result than mother company, I, I imagine. But uh, this does not shift the pressure out of uh, the ship owning side because they want always to beat the market and to show that they are below the index. So I, I understand that the pressure to the ship owning arm is the same as we have. Exactly. Yeah. I agree. Any comments? Well, as an owner, I cannot really comment. I don't know. But uh, as a charterer, although we have not fixed for quite a while with Barry, uh, I suspect they are in the same position because what they have been trying, as any other charterer, because what they have been trying is to get the cheapest cost for the vessels they fixed. Unlike us ship owners who try to get the highest. So you don't consider them tough negotiators? They just basically, they pay the market? I'm sorry, you didn't Do you consider Bari a, a tough negotiator? No, they are tough negotiators. Very and tough, very and tough. And sometimes I, I find them quite <laughs> inflexible. Very tough. <laughs> but charterers would consider you tough. Ask them. <laughs> <laughs> we are tough, Michael, but if we need some business, we are flexible enough to get it. Okay, let's uh, turn the uh, topic to renewables and technology. While the major development in the, in the 1990s, excuse me, was the introduction of double hull vessels, today's focus is on minimizing the industry's impact on the environment and global warming. New initiatives include the IMO's guidelines on water ballast treatment systems and the ever-tightening sulfur caps on bunker fuels. Where does each company stand with regard to implementation of these new regulations. Why don't you start, Mr. Sahara? We're talking about... Uh, sulfur. Sulfur. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, we, we are uh, studying this now, and we are, uh, as I said earlier, we, with each regulation that comes out, we try to be ahead of the curves. Um, uh, it's going to be inevitable, and I think uh, it will make, uh, at the end of the day, it will probably be better for the industry because it, it will take some tonnage out of the market that doesn't comply with these regulations. So 
at the end of the day, it shall help the rates. And it's only the big ship owners who can afford to comply that will weather the storm and be there. Uh, and, and I think it's a healthy sign at the end of the day. It will be tough in the short term, but long term, it's good for the business. Is that so good? Well, uh, as far as uh, ballast water treatment, uh, practically half of our fleet uh, has it already, mm. and we have a plan to implement it uh, between now and uh, the implementation date uh, in 2020, at some point in the future, to the rest of the vessels. Uh, it's a cumbersome system. It's not easy to operate. <laughs> we try to learn it internally in the company. As far as the more complex regulation of uh, emissions, uh, that's something that everybody has his own view. My view is that eventually uh, we are going uh, to have to use initially both scrubbers and 0.5 fuel, 0.5% uh, fuel, but there is not enough in the market. Sooner or later, refineries, I think, are going to have more fuel produced. And the price differential between 3.5 and 0.5 will reduce a lot. For the time being, it appears commercially scrubbers are more beneficial to a company if you have the money to implement it, to put them on the vessel, and this is something that deters a lot of people from doing it. Plus, the industry cannot produce enough scrubbers. Whatever we say, they cannot feed all the vessels sailing with scrubbers. Some people say oh, something happened. Okay, you're fine. It's okay? Yeah. Uh, some people say that only 5% of the scrubbers needed are going to be produced. Yeah. Let me, let me approach this on a bigger picture, because we see the small picture. The, the good intentions are there with the regulators, but they have the wrong target. Correct. It is like asking the truck driver, the taxi driver, to modify his engine in order to meet the new regulations. These are not happening in any other industry. I believe that uh, this uh, uh, focus should be in the engine makers, on the shipyards, to comply and, of course, if, if the technical and uh, engineering side can meet these uh, requirements. Here we have uh, the biggest hypocrisy that exists because we are asking the user to upgrade the equipment, which it is not new anymore, because you have to install these on ships that are five years old, 10 years old, 15 years old, and there is no bigger pollution than creating, first of all, scrapping useful equipment or building equipment that you put on board and the duration of the contribution of saving saves less uh, pollution from manufacturing it first. Secondly, we have to see globally what is the pollution. So the scrubber, what does? We put the pollution in the water, in the sea. So it is an issue where you put the pollution and how you dispose that. And all this is the lobbying of manufacturers to make new business. I go one step further. We see this in also the ballast water treatment. And I was talking to the IMO general uh, secretary and uh, he gave this extension for two and a half years. There is no more the, uh, uh, 
sure, uh, sure way to ridiculate an organization if they try to impose regulations that, you can, that cannot be fulfilled. I ask, I give a deadline, but there is no, no way you can buy. So what you do, you retreat it and you put it again and so on. And this is going to happen again on, on the... And if everybody cares so much about accelerating the impact of shipping, although shipping is the less polluting per ton industry for transportation and also you want an immediate result, and as all the vessels are equipped with AIS, Automatic Identification System, make by rule that you don't go above 11 knots. <coughs> Immediately, the pollution that you create, it's much less than what you will achieve by installing all these things. And the ones, the party that decides to, to run and go faster, pays for the, if the charterers want to go faster, he pays to the green uh, fund. If the owner wants to have better results going fast, he pays to the green, but the world will become cleaner from Monday to Tuesday. 11 knot speed, blanket for all ships. I think you should advise the regulator. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, yeah, I agree. both of you are in the LNG business. How do you see LNG as a bunkering fuel? I'm sorry, I didn't hear... How do you see LNG as a possible bunkering fuel? I think it's a good fuel, and it's a cheap one, as a matter of fact. For certain trades today, you can use it quite a lot. But it is very expensive to create dual fuel vessels because you cannot have bunkering stations with LNG when you want them, even for bigger vessels which have more set trades. As such, you are going to have to spend so much money that the amortization is quite long. This will deter a lot of people from doing it. Some people are doing, and we are doing that with certain of our new buildings, to have LNG-ready vessels. I don't know really how important it is because I am not technical. But it's a nice gimmick that you can sell to the industry. I believe that we have entered in the age of natural gas. This is something that we cannot uh, exclude, uh, not uh, avoid. On the contrary, it's a very interesting development, but uh, for our friends that are producing uh, crude oil only, is the big competition. The big competition will be natural gas. But there is room for both these fossil fuels to exist. Definitely, we see the uh, bunkering uh, chain to be enlarged uh, to include LNG uh, option to, 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 to have on board. It's a matter also of pricing. It is the quick fix for SOXES and NOXES emission. It is a 30% reduction on CO2 emissions. And uh, this eventually will come <coughs> already on the LNG vessels, LNG carriers, we see that we are burning uh, the, the cargo. This was the dream of the owners in the past. So now it is uh, <laughs> legal and official. So, <laughs> and uh, we have the uh, implementation becoming easier and easier. We cannot avoid, it's a matter of pricing, more and more production is coming, and uh, uh, I see that on fixed uh, trades and routes, this will be sooner than later, and we have to be prepared. I, uh, I agree with what's being said. I don't think uh, we in Bahri don't have, uh, you know, LNG bunk bunkering facility on, uh, on our ships. We don't have any ships that are LNG ready. 
I think there is an issue of uh, the availability, the ports, uh, uh, and pricing. Uh, but I agree with the direction. Yeah. Some of the major if, oil companies. If sorry. I can say only on that, because we have investigated it, because we participated in a tender recently uh, for a dry cargo VLOC vessel. And it was 25% extra cost there you go. to produce mm -hmm. dual fuel vessel. Yeah. And this was uh, for a company that was intending to use the vessel back and forth, Brazil to China. And still, they decided not to go for that. It's an expensive option until we have too many bunkering stations yes. and the yards reduce the cost. 25% is a hell of a lot. Thank you. Some of the major oil companies have started to talk about peak oil demand over the long term. Shell's CEO recently said that in its most aggressive scenario, oil demand could peak by the late 2020s or early 2030s. Others like BP and Total give another 10 to 15 years. However, they all agree that this transition is unstoppable. So I ask each one of you the question, are we building the last generation of tankers or can the industry reinvent itself and keep demand growing over a much longer period? Sir. Why do you want to start with me? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, two weeks ago, there was a, an investment conference in, in Saudi Arabia, and uh, some distinguished investors were there and regulators. And uh, uh, Christine Lagarde from the IMF was there, and she said that uh, GDP growth across the world at least for next year and the year after will be at least 3.7%, which is a comforting thing. So growth will be there. Uh, true, this is average between uh, ma markets that are growing faster like India and China and markets that are stagnating in some of the world. Uh, so demand will be there to the extent of 4% growth in, in the GDP. So that's one point. Second point is that 40% uh, of power that is generated in the world today is still using coal. So we, there is room to grow to the extent of 40% of the power generation need for oil. Uh, all the renewables still account for less than 10% of world consumption. Uh, electric cars, again, uh, I, I think today w we have uh, 1.3 uh, million uh, electric cars out of a population of 1.5 billion cars. So there is, there is still room. Uh, it is said that in, in 2040, there will be over 500 million electric cars. But by then, the population of cars will be 2 billion. So we're still talking about only 25%. So if you put all this together, demand for oil in the foreseeable future will be good. And I think for that, we will, us in the tanker business, we will still have business to go for quite some time. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry. And one thing to add, uh, at least for us in this region, Saudi Arabia has the cheapest uh, oil production cost. So if the last uh, tanker will be built in, hopefully by then in Saudi Arabia and Ras Al Khair, maybe the last uh, barrel will be produced and carried by that tanker from Saudi Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Thank you. Uh, yes. I think uh, first of all, I'm an optimist, and I have heard uh, statistics like those you are mentioning uh, before. 
First of all, uh, the, grow, the world that grows and grows really fast needs cars. To catch up in energy consumption with the Western world, they have a long way to go still. Uh, batteries need con energy to be built and they are still not good in a lot of environments. The world, as Mr. al Sarhan said, uses an awful lot of coal and I am not talking about China and India. I am yeah. talking about the Western world. They pay lip service to the environment simply because it is cheap. And they'll continue to do that as long as it suits them. And let's not forget that electric cars are very expensive. They are not as cheap as we think. But I'll say another statistic. Trucks have exploded in the world, the number of trucks. Can they use batteries? No. Aeroplanes, which are the biggest polluters, don't use batteries. They are not electric. And two statistics I mention only. The IEA predicted, according to some recent uh, study I, I had, that in 2020-30, out of 62 million cars in Southeast Asia, only 4 million are going to be electric. And Patrick Kuyan, the CEO of Total, in an interview he gave recently, in an aggressive scenario, he said, in 2040, mm. they say if 50% of the world's cars are electric, the impact on the overall consumption is going to be minimal. They said 8 million barrels per day at the end of the day. And that was a very aggressive scenario, he said. But let's face it, CEOs at the end of the day have to pay lip service to the environment because of their shareholders. We must not forget that. Mr. Prokopio. Again, here we have a big hypocrisy. It's an, another big uh, sector. Of course, the car industry needs to build hybrid cars, electric cars. We sell the old ones, old ones three years old, four years old, to buy a new car and so on. If again, we really care about the environment, uh, by paying $500 per car, converting it to burn CNG, you have immediate zero shocks, zero noxes, and you don't recycle useful equipment with a good car that you dump it to buy the electric car. But if we go on uh, to see the bigger picture, uh, and uh, is that the car, the electric car, the batteries, the it should be charged, they need a, somewhere else in another place. Of course, you remove the pollution from the city and you put it in the, where the factory is that is producing the electricity. So coming uh, in uh, your actual question about peak oil and peak demand, this is a matter of pricing. If, as they say, Aramco has a per barrel cost below $10, because the investment is there and everything, and they have, they can reduce the price, we will see the demand of oil to triple. So it is a matter of how they balance and how they, they, they see the future. The Iraq, Iran, Venezuela, they have huge, huge uh, 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 reserves of crude oil. And if they lower the price, they break the bone of any other competition. It's a matter of balance of a program. Uh, so I, what I have, we have to say here is the 100 million barrels per day that the world consumption is, with a $60 uh, differential from the peak, is a direct uh, uh, 
uh, QE to the pockets of the consumers of $6 billion per day. And this over the two years is four and a half trillion dollars direct subsidy to the world consumers. This is leading to a market that will be booming for the next 10 years. I am very optimistic. All the QE that the uh, uh, European governments and the US government uh, was uh, uh, injecting went to rectify the balance sheets of their banks. To the real consumption and consumer, <coughs> nothing went. What is going every day is the differential with the cheap oil. And as oil is going hand by hand with the world growth, and now we have a world growth of above 3%, but a whole world, that means that we are heading for very good times. So I don't ag agree that we'll see the peak oil. It is in the hands of this area and a couple uh, uh, more. And uh, they can, the sooner they realize that the low price is to their benefit, because with a high price, we had all this evolution of uh, uh, eolic energy, uh, photovoltaic, and other types. If oil can break the back of any such attempt. And my last uh, point that I want to make, when Mrs. Merkel in Germany made the agreement with the Greens not to extend on the atomic power plants, that's why they are together in the government, they had to, how to do it, to cope with it, the, because the renewables that ended up to be 30% with heavy subsi subsidies, <coughs> all energy producing companies in Germany are in worse state of their banks, almost bankrupt, and in order to make up, they import coal and they burn coal. So the end result is the atmosphere in Germany is in worse condition than before where they were not uh, these renewables of such big participation. So all this, uh, it is uh, uh, politis, uh, po politics and uh, lip service, as uh, Mr. Agilicusius called it several times. Thank you. We must okay. not forget, Michael, sorry to... Uh, to add that in 1980 we are predicting that there is going to be so little oil that we will have to burn very soon wood. <laughs> uh, I mean the predictions of people uh, are like that. Uh, what can we do? It's uh, okay. Could I count on politicians. Uh, Mr. Hassan, last year you identified big data, in your own words, as, quote, as the next frontier for sustainable business growth in the maritime industry. Bari rolled out a series of initiatives aimed at harnessing the power of data innovation to enhance productivity, to unlock opportunities for growth, and to transform existing operational models in the shipping industry. In fact, Bari created a dedicated big data platform, Bari Data. One year after launching this initiative, what have been the initial results and what are the challenges that remain? Um, for for uh, those of you who were here yesterday, we had a, a whole day on, on big data and we had some Dis distinguished guests who uh, elaborated and enriched the discussion around the subject. Uh, Bahri wanted to be uh, one of the early adopters of uh, the implementation of big data. And uh, one year ago, a year and a half ago, we established a dedicated unit uh, in the company for big data. Uh, we are still at the very beginning. Uh, we're already seeing the results within the company when it relates to uh, safety, failure prevention, on, on uh, predictions on engines, 
Uh, and I hope to reach the day where we can predict the rates, but uh, we're <laughs> going to be quite, <laughs> quite a while from that, I'm afraid. Uh, but definitely, big data is is the uh, is the new trend, and it is the uh, drilling down and using the data with you know mathematical algorithm to predict trends and. Once you see and predict trends, you can make assumptions, and these assumptions can be validated on, on uh, future information. I, uh, we're linking up with uh, pioneers in the area to, uh, to uh, avail their knowledge and also uh, excel in this area. But we are definitely in the beginning. What do you think the opportunities or challenges of technology and the use of big data in the shipping industry? I don't think uh, we have any choice but to accept that big data is in our life. Yeah. Uh, this does not mean that we'll stop using gut feeling <coughs> and instinct when we buy vessels. However, uh, the office is run by technology, whether I want to accept it or not. Uh, ten years ago, we had three people uh, working in the IT department. Now we have about 25. I know the company has grown, but it has not grown eight times. <laughs> and uh, what is more is they are demanded by charterers, when they vet the company, and they are demanded by auditors when they do the accounts. Still, I think that they are helping a lot. They are helping in a lot of ways. I don't know if we can go through, I mean, the influence big data has in our communication, first of all, with the vessels. The internet provider, we have on the vessels for the entertainment of the crew and other uses, the instantaneous transmission of files back and forth between office and vessel, which unfortunately has created an awful lot of communication. We receive pictures and all sorts of useless information constantly. But that's part and parcel of the whole thing. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, we are living in a different era. Well, I mean, I, I never thought I would have an iPhone, and I am looking forward to buy the iPhone X uh, because they tell me it's going to be even more useful. I don't even know in what way, and I am not technologically good. It's the broken John, you said it all, but uh, I want to add, this is an additional tool, and always the human judgment and intuition will be of paramount importance. It would be very sad to believe that the machines can make the decisions. We see all these artificial intelligence and the robots that they are talking to each other and so on, <laughs> and we admire all this, but at least in our lifespan, we believe that we'll take the decisions the way that we are taking so far. So it is a tool. We try to take the advantages. We are using it. Maybe our kids, our grandkids, they will have a different world. For the time being, we should not worry too much. <laughs> okay, the, we have, I have to ask a question to all of you, and this is an important question. As ships, ports, global navigation technologies and supply chains, get, they get smarter. The risk of cyber attack grows. The impact can be disastrous. Tanker groundings, collisions, oil spills, environmental damage, etc. What preventive measures is your company adopting to enhance security? Shall I start with you, please? Definitely, the industry is uh, the uh, IT industry 
is uh, providing new tools to cope with the needs that they are producing. So it's a vicious cycle. They are producing better machines, clever, more clever machines, so better antivirus, and the, uh, uh, how you call it, uh, all these protection uh, that you need for your uh, IT systems. But this is contradicting because it looks that the old uh, challenge, uh, the old uh, ways that navigators were navigating, they have to be kept alive, alive, and compare because they have seen interfering in the GPS and showing a very wrong uh, uh, position on the map. So, or sometimes this, because of other uh, electronic jamming, uh, we have seen uh, cases that they were uh, exercises from uh, uh, navies, that the GPS or the communications are not working at all. So I do believe that the, uh, as, as they say, you do all these things, but you buy a cut as well. So you have the traditional way to uh, check and cross-check what is going on. Uh, we cannot rely only on the machines. The ability of the captains and the engineers should be always there to see if the data are within the parameters and the reality that exist. Uh, what worries me is uh, <coughs> what uh, George said, that all this electronic equipment we have on board the vessel and particularly on the bridge uh, suddenly does not work, which proves the point that probably a cyber attack is possible. Let's put it more simply. One of the seamen had a USB and because it was infected, it infected the systems on the vessel. And this is something we must not overlook. It happens, he didn't know it was infected. Cybersecurity is the main concern of most organizations I have talked to in the United States, from JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, that's one thing they worry about. We have lost a lot of times uh, files instantaneously, and sometimes we lost them for a day. Something is going on. I have been on the road, I say just an example. I have been on the road for 10, 11 days now. And two days ago, I lost all my incoming emails. I have no idea what I did, I must have pushed something. But then I realized that there was some infected email sent to me. Probably they are somewhere here, I don't know how to get them, but hopefully somebody in the office in a few days will find them. Cybersecurity is a problem. And now we have a department in the office with four people. We didn't have a department two years ago. I, um, I don't have a lot to add, but I think, uh, again, uh, yesterday uh, we, we also touched on this subject. Uh, cybersecurity is definitely uh, a risk, and it's a risk on every business. Uh, you know, shipping is not completely dependent on IT as other uh, sectors like banking and other, uh, and other sectors of the economy, but as the use of big data uh, increases, they also the risk of cyber attacks increase. But uh, luckily, the uh, technology and prevention uh, measures are uh, also in place to uh, mitigate that risk. Just to continue with you. Uh, if I can add okay. something, Michael, sorry. Cybersecurity, we have no choice. The charterers want it when they audit the company. They ask you, are you prepared for a zero-day attack? Mm -hmm. The accountants want it. 
So it's not up to us. Cyber security is there to stay. Mr. Al-Sahar, we have all, we all hear and we read about Saudi Arabia's vision for the future. Vision 2030. And we are all reading about Saudi Arabia recently in the press, almost daily. What impact will this have on the international shipping market in general, and specifically for Bari? Well, it's a big question, but I, I will answer as it relates to Bahri. Well, first of all, uh, we are a, a national player, a big national player, and we are committed, of course, to support the vision of the, of the Saudi Arabian government to 2030, uh, and we are committed to be an enabler of the vision. I will mention only two programs that, uh, uh, through which we are part and parcel of this uh, vision. One is the big uh, maritime initiative uh, initiated by Ramco and Ras Al Khair. We are a 20% equity uh, investor in the, in the yard, and uh, work has already started. Uh, we are represented in the steering committee of the project, and this is going to be a very big initiative and hopefully uh, a successful one. And we've also committed to be the first big buyers of the ship, big builders of the ship that this yard will, will, uh, will produce. Uh, the second uh, initiative is one, one of the uh, pillars of the vision is to enable uh, private sector enterprise to grow exponentially. They, they have an initiative called, uh, I think, NCPP, National Company Promotion Program. Uh, we have positioned Bahri to be uh, one of the pioneers of the NCPP, and uh, hopefully we're looking for government agencies to help us uh, uh, grow exponentially, enter into other sectors, grow within our sectors, and be uh, truly an international player and contribute to world, uh, world growth and world economy uh, through uh, the implementation of Saudi vision. Just brief answers, please, because we're running out of time. Tropical storms, hurricanes, earthquakes have dominated the news in recent months. They've brought devastation to millions around the world. Some experts believe weather patterns have changed permanently because of global warming. What are your views about global warming? Well, okay. Uh, well, uh, global warming uh, is something that is there and it's affecting our business. But global warming is a misnomer. This is actually a facet of climate change, which could be both uh, global warming or global cooling. Uh, from our side, uh, we have implemented in our vessels, and not only tankers, uh, most environmental and efficiency standards uh, we could at the time we built them. It reduces consumption and improves environmental footprint. As far as I'm concerned, we have put our money where our mouth is and we are reducing, if you want to call it global warming in this respect, to the expect we can. I believe that uh, every, if we talk about uh, ships, every newer vessel is more environmental friendly. Now, if, uh, if the global uh, warming is because of, uh, or cooling is because of uh, human activity, I'm not yet so much convinced because uh, uh, we, it is very uh, self uh, uh, boosting that we can impact the world climate, we humans. 
but, uh, but uh, uh, I believe that they are cycles, that they are not recorded, and we have seen over the, the historic uh, and prehistoric periods, that the periods of, of icebergs, of, of, of the rain, of droughts, we have seen, we, they say, the historians. So I don't believe that our lifespan is so long and the historic span of statistics to say with accuracy that this is because of that and the other. Of course, this creates huge uh, business opportunities. It, co it causes also huge uh, cause, uh, causes of uh, uh, activists to be around and say things and influence, lobbying and so on. And we have to comply, of course, and to do whatever the trend is. We cannot go against the trend. But if it is actually uh, man-made or this volcano or the explosions in the, in the sun and so on, nobody knows these things. And uh, we, uh, of course, uh, it, when you talk even with very important scientists, you see that in the depth in their talk, they have a doubt if it is or it is not. And nobody can solve this question. We have to adapt and to go with the trend. But maybe later, but even if we go to extremes, no matter if it is heat or cold, more energy will be needed. So that is good news. Thank you. And in brief. <laughs> in practical terms. I, uh, you know, global warming is something that is uh, here to stay. It's a fact. And I don't think we are qualified enough from a scientific point of view to judge whether it's a, a gimmick or not. I tend to believe that it is say, a reality. Uh, um, most of the countries are committed to the Paris Accord uh, of uh, limiting global warming. I, I'm not sure if our industry is shipping is a big contributor to, to uh, pollution. I think there are industries in the world that are uh, more of a culprit than, than the shipping. Uh, however, uh, as the gentleman said, uh, we are all, all our ships are compliant and we try to limit the emissions bo both to the sea and to the air. And uh, uh, this is something that is not going to affect us in this room. I think it will affect the generations to come. So we have to be responsible uh, and do what we can do to contribute. For you two gentlemen, the Brexit vote was reached in 2016. What impact, if any, do you think it will have on London as an international shipping center? I'll speak first. And as a consequence. <laughs> I'll speak first. Do you dominate, wait, 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 wait. Do you believe the dominant uh, position of Greece will be reinforced. I'll speak first because I am more affected. Uh, first of all, uh, because of Brexit, a lot of financial institutions have scaled down or left uh, their position in Britain. And for people who remained there, for ship owners, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, they'll have a problem, but hardly ever remained there in any case. Uh, a lot of them have expanded in Greece and other places. Uh, what basically the Brexit vote is a vote uh, against uh, foreigners. Britain is an isolationist country and they never liked basically foreigners. Oh, <laughs> I have lived in Britain for 44 years, Michael, more than half of my life. I left because we were sent away because of non dom and that's how most Greeks left. Brexit has nothing to do with that. Okay, Mr. Brooks, we go. Of course, I don't have the experience of uh, John. Uh, he has been there for many years. But as a, an observer from far away, since the people left without Brexit, 
there are more chances that they'll have an opportunity to go back because of Brexit, because something will change and might change for the better. I don't think that without having the domination of Germany and France, which I don't expect the ordinary British uh, voter to like, to comply with what Berlin or Paris is saying. So this was a vote of expressing their feelings towards this domination and the straight jacket that they had to wear. But now, uh, if it is handled, because they took even the politicians that are, were advocating this by surprise, that they didn't expect this to be a reality, that's why they disappeared everybody. And now, they, if they use it uh, wisely, uh, with bilateral agreements, will be f for the good of the UK, and I'll always UK was something in between Europe and United States, was something in between, uh, a buffer and a, a, a different uh, third uh, approach. Uh, I believe eventually for shipping will be a good thing. I beg to disagree, but that's a big subject. Yes. I have been following what's going on there for a long time because I was there during the referendum and I think they wanted it. The majority of the people wanted it, but leave it. It would be very, very dull if we would agree, John. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now... Let, let, we, no, you don't have let, much time, Michael. Yes. I see you are... Okay. Um, <laughs> we have talked about the threats and challenges to the industry. Now, let us think positively about the future. What do you think are the biggest opportunities in the tanker market going forward? Sir. Um, we, uh, I, I agree with, uh, with uh, John and George. I, I am personally an optimist, and I think uh, there will continue to be uh, demand uh, for the tanker market. Today, unfortunately, it's uh, supply-driven. There's more tonnage in the market than necessary. Uh, but the demand for oil uh, will continue. And uh, I, uh, I think uh, uh, with the enforcement of the regulation, more scrapping will, will occur, so t more tonnage will also exit. Uh, uh, I think I am an optimist. I think it's uh, going forward. One has to look uh, long term. And uh, I think it's time for the uh, strong-hearted, as the point, uh, <laughs> as opposed to the faint-hearted. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, uh, the growth in the world, in particular pl places where uh, the population growth and high GDP growth is very high, is helping immensely our industry. These people want more oil, and they are far away from reaching the levels we are consuming. Another important thing which probably we are overlooking is sale. In the United States, this has created a revolution for the industry because it has created a new loading area for our types of vessels, the VLCCs and Suez Maxes. And this is going to grow. That's a fact. Whether it's two and a half million in a couple of years, or seven and a half million, as OPEC predicts, in a bit longer, it's even better. But the most important thing I have found the last several years is low interest rates and low inflation. This has helped the world to grow in sync in some way like the United States, Europe, and the Third World, together, of course, with Asia and Korea, with, uh, Japan and Korea, at a certain level, three and a half, maybe four percent. How long it will remain, I don't know. 
but that's a good sign for me. I do believe that uh, always uh, a company that uh, has uh, quality and safety uh, levels to satisfy the most demanding customers, coupled with innovation, openness, participation, and synergies will be a growth path and taking into account that India is coming up at a very strong pace where still 30% of the population they have or 40 electricity for a couple hours of the day and uh, all the openness that is generated with the Belt and Road Initiative, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, which will change the world in the Middle East and the balances, because wherever is a vacuum, somebody is taking, as I said before, and now, again, Americans are retreating, Chinese are coming. And for Europe, it's good news, because only if these areas are developed enough at the, to retain their population in their homes. Nobody wants to become a refugee or an immigrant. They want to stay there. And this needs lots and lots of infrastructure. And we have to join forces on these initiatives to be part of it, to see it with openness and acceptance. So the uh, Iraq, Syria, uh, Lebanon uh, to be rebuilt and being rebuilt in this effort will have tremendous uh, business for the years to come. And there is only with this method human suffering will uh, be eased and the world will become a safer place. Okay, I'm being told the time's up, but however, I have one last question. What keeps you up at night? And, cons and more importantly, what gets you up in the morning? What keeps you up at night? And more importantly, what gets you up in the morning? Can I, can I stop? I, I, I think what uh, keeps us up at night in the shipping business uh, uh, our uh, incidents, uh, you know, accidents where, uh, you know, in a, in a VLCC business when an accident happened or an incident happened, it's devastating and it's, it's very big, both on the environment, on the uh, value. Uh, cyber attack is also something that keeps us, uh, you know, worried. Uh, at one point in time, uh, we were uh, heightened and worried about piracy. It seemed to have uh, uh, you know, submerged nowadays. Uh, now, what keeps us uh, uh, happy in the morning or go to work in the morning is uh, value creation for our shareholders. We would like uh, in the morning to think of new ways to create value for our shareholder and uh, to enjoy working with our colleagues Good. and be a better citizen of the world. Very uh, briefly, please. Uh, normally I sleep uh, reasonably soundly and I don't worry uh, in the evening. The only time I must say I lost my sleep was when we had one of our VLCCs kidnapped. Fortunately, it was one of the first to be kidnapped at the time by the Somali pirates. It lasted 50 days, and as far as I'm concerned, I lost quite a few years of my life then. I was hoping to get them free for Christmas, for New Year, but eventually it happened on the 20th of January. Now, uh, safe oil transportation does not worry me. It has become so safe as statistics demonstrate that I am not going to worry about something happening in the evening. 
usually nothing happens. Uh, as far as what makes us get up, I would say is we have a rather exciting office. Usually something is going on as a rule every day. And it's great to go there and see what can we do and develop it. In the Briefly, interest please. of time, I'll, ask half, I'll reply half of your question. I sleep very well at night. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, we have, some, we have a few minutes. Questions from the audience, please. You have a microphone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, uh, for very interesting uh, discussion, really, and uh, for sharing your uh, unique uh, and uh, insightful uh, perspective on the industry. You are great leaders of, uh, and very accomplished. You have the history. You have been through a lot of cycles. You have seen the ups and the downs, and you have navigated through them. You are also uh, clearly uh, leaders of, uh, with passion and uh, vision of the future. If I ask in 20 years from today, how do you see the tanker uh, shipping industry different from now? And what threats do you worry about the most? Somebody? Are you well? First of all, uh, it's going to be changing technologically not very much, although there is going to be evolution with the vessels. And definitely, there is going to be more efficiency and fewer emissions and all that. Uh, apart from that, uh, I think the tanker industry is going to be there in 20 years. Uh, I think it's going to be there in my lifetime if I'm there in 20 years, and I hope I'll be. As far as I'm concerned, uh, the world is going to need all the energy forms it can afford, afford in the 2035-2040 uh, without any doubt. Okay. I think, Jonathan, you had a question. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering uh, what the panel saw as the greatest danger uh, for a resurgence in the tanker market. Is it uh, persistent oversupply in shipbuilding capacity? Or alternatively, new innovative financing arrangements coming into our market? Or thirdly, is it the ship owners themselves? Uh, nobody can uh, predict, but uh, in uh, personally, uh, restraint is very important from ship owners. But I am the first one that I'm not disciplined, so I cannot make suggestions for the others. So the, the truth is that competition, fear, and uh, and uh, eagerness to grow, we have always to find a balance. The cycles will continue to exist, and the ups and downs, and no matter how much we try to avoid them, the pendulum will always go further from one direction and further to the other. It will never stay in the middle. So it will be always challenging and will never will be easy. Uh, I don't see a, a, a fix on that. So the if life I, will keep on like this. Yeah. And the last, if you remember from the history books, from the times of Pharaoh, they were the seven lean years and the seven good years. So it keeps on going. If I could add only to what uh, Mr. Prokopiu said, uh, we are the main culprits uh, for what is going wrong in supply and demand. We have been, at least as a rule in the past, However, the last 10 years, we have seen other reasons to have problems in our industry. The financial meltdown which happened in 2008 and affected us was not our problem. And it was the banks that created it. What happened in the early part of this decade, it was the funds investing 
other people's money in shipping they did not understand. And this created quite an oversupply of vessels in a lot of sectors. Let's not go into that now. Okay, one last question. Hello, I'm uh, Mark Richardson, uh, chairman of uh, Simpson Spence and Young. And I just wanted to um, uh, touch on the big data point from uh, a broker's point of view. I see it that uh, brokers uh, have always been the uh, funnel of information uh, in our markets to principals like yourselves. Uh, how does the panel see the effect of big data affecting uh, the role of the broker uh, and also uh, their relationship uh, with uh, the broking community? Always the broker is the matchmaker between the owner and charterer. Always the broker will be needed to provide business. And always the role of the broker is of paramount importance. And the more he concentrates with, with a client, the more business is generated. These things will never change, and the machines cannot overtake the humans, in, especially in this business, which is so much interaction. This is my opinion. Okay, one, just to summarize, uh, first of all, you know, in Greek mythology, the Titans fought the gods, and the gods won. So about the future, God only knows. So I thank everyone for coming. I thank you for joining today, for hosting us. I hope you found the uh, discussion interesting. I apologize for my cold, and thank you very, very much. Enjoy lunch.